All right, hello everyone. Welcome to another my live streams. This is Eric Keller, and uh, I apologize for the schedule mix-up. Uh, April's been kind of a crazy month with work and everything, but I want to continue where I was going to go, where I was headed from. I want to continue from where I left off last week, and I'm working on some flower designs specifically so that my wasp model has something to perch on. So eventually we're going to pose this this little guy. And I thought it'd be nice to put it on a little flower. And so I put together some of the reference. These are all photographs that I've taken. And I kind of decided to do something like this. I kind of like this sort of repeated design. So if you can check out the stream from last week, you'll see how I got to the where I'm at now. So let's see, that's right here. And uh, I wanted to talk about how to polypate and detail these guys without having to do each one individually, at least not right off. Uh, little time-saving tips that you can do. Uh, before I get into that though, I want to share a little bit some of the stuff that I have available online. I'm also getting over a stuffy nose, apologize for that. So I have some courses on Udemy. I just released this one like a week or so ago. This is uh, demystifying ZBrush materials. So everything you want to know about how to work with ZBrush materials, whether it's standard materials, uh, MatCap materials, Redshift materials, how to create your own customized materials. It's about a three hour long uh, course. There's a free preview chapter that you can check out. And uh, so it covers uh, ZBrush materials. I think it's very valuable because it's not something that's covered by a whole lot of people. So it's only $19.99. And watch out for sales that UDB has occasionally. So I think brand new course, 2024. And uh, I go into depth about uh, Redshift materials as well. And I'll be talking about Redshift materials as I continue with this project. A couple other courses I have on Udemy. Uh, ZBrush for jewelry designers. This is fundamentals. This is really for anybody that wants a nice comprehensive course on all the fundamentals of ZBrush. And uh, this one is, uh, let me see how many chapters it is. It's fairly long and fairly comprehensive. A lot of load there, but uh, it really focuses on, really you could also call it ZBrush for 3D printing, but it's, it's mostly all the fundamentals with an eye towards uh, doing stuff for uh, 3D printing or jewelry design. So it's four hours total, 15 lectures. And then the other one I have is ZBrush for Jewelry Designers, Understanding ZBrush Geometry. So this basically talks about all the different types of ZBrush geometry, whether it's uh, subdivision surfaces, um, DynaMesh, uh, NanoMesh, uh, all the different meshes, what the differences are, and the advantages of using each type. Again, with the idea of uh, headed towards 3D printing for jewelry. So check those out on udemy.com. The other thing I want to point out is that my channel, Entomology Animated, has a whole bunch of videos uh, based on insect sculpting, time-lapse uh, stuff. So I have like a time-lapse on creating this uh, rainbow scarab beetle, and uh, you can check it out, um, along with a whole bunch of other videos also on how I set these up for rendering and so on and so forth. So check out entomologyanimated.com, sorry, entomologyanimated.com or check out YouTube Entomology Animated for more information on that. And with that out of the way, let's get to some sculpting here in ZBrush. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out was how I set this up last week. So if you recall, I sculpted one of these little suckers right here. Pretty simple overall. And I used uh, array mesh to basically duplicate it quickly and then arranged it and then I converted it into a mesh. And I also went in with the move brush and kind of created some variation. Now the one thing that I did that I think is an important step, and this is a time saving tip, is before I did array mesh or anything like that, I set up UVs for my original initial model. That way, if you take a look at the UVs, right? If I go down here to UV map and I'll hit morph UV, this is what the UVs look like. Pretty simple, I just used the UV master and polygroups to kind of split it up. And nothing award-winning about it, but it's completely functional. And of course, when I used a ray mesh to duplicate all these, well, they all came with the exact same UVs, right? So they're just stacked on top of each other. So the reason I did this is because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one of these 
detail it, polypate it, convert that into a texture, bring the texture, bring it back to all of these, convert that texture to polypate, and then I've got a base coat for all of my things done really quickly without having to go in and do a base coat for each one individually. And then of course I can then paint in the variations. So let's go about doing that. So what I'll do is uh, I'm going to clone this. So it just makes a copy. So I don't want to mess up my original. Let's go to the clone here. And I'm going to control shift click on this. So I don't have anything else. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here. Well, actually, before I do that, let's let's bring that back. Control shift click to bring everything back. Remember, everything's a different poly group here. Uh, I'm going to go down here to geometry and set it to the lowest subdivision level. So we're the subdivision level one. Now let's do that in that control shift click on one of these to hide everything else. I'm going to go to the sub tool sub palette and I'm going to go down to split and I'm going to split hidden. Now the reason I like split hidden is because when you use split hidden as opposed to delete hidden or whatever, split hidden preserves the subdivision levels and also the UV. So it keeps everything intact uh, just because sometimes when you do delete hidden or something like that, it can throw things out of whack, especially with UVs. So I like split hidden because it's really safe. All it does is it makes a new sub tool out of everything that was hidden, right? So that's my new sub tool. And then I have this individual one all by itself. So I like to use that. I could always delete that extra sub tool if I don't need it. It doesn't really matter. So, okay. Now, now that I have that out of the way, I can go up to highest subdivision level. And the highest subdivision level is like 12,000. So I'm going to hit Control D to subdivide this. Get it up to uh, 3 million is just fine. Plenty of points to work with. And I'm going to switch over to Skin Shade 4. Hello, everybody. This is just joining me. Thanks very much for uh, spending time with me today as I go over some flower modeling techniques. And I'm going to keep the uh, reference here off to the side so you have an idea of what I'm trying to do. I like this one right here because it's not too bunchy. Get this into the corner, la da da da, da. and see so it like that. And then of course, eventually I'm going to use fiber mesh to create all the little hairs. Got to have flower uh, hairs on your plants; makes everything look much cooler. Okay, so let's see if I do something like this. And what I love about you know uh, poly painting and ZBrush, and also using reference. You know, I'm using a fictional wasp here, so my plant is somewhat fictional as well. But still, I like to draw on reference from nature, and I love to look at the variation of colors in here. We see a lot of complementary colors. We see a lot of red, obviously, but it also transitions into green and yellow and also purple. So these are all things that I want to pay attention to. We have a, kind of a magenta down here. So I kind of want to blend these in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my initial base coat here and maybe kind of a yellowish green, not too saturated, something like this, just to get some color on there. So I'm going to switch over to the paint brush and I'll choose color fill object. Okay. So the paint brush, I'm going to lower my RGB intensity. There's no Z add on. So this is just going to be color. It's not going to be doing any sculpting at this point. I might do a little bit of that later. Um, and then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the shift key for my smooth brush and I'm going to turn off Z add and bring down RGB intensity. So what that means is now my smooth brush is a blur brush. So as I start to paint on here, so let's get some color spray going and I'm going to go to the stroke palette and re reduce the color variation. And let's pick kind of an orange, orangey color just to begin with. Now I'll start to paint on here. Let's get an alpha on here so I get some more discrete dots. All right, so I get this. And what I can do is if I hold the shift key instead of smoothing it, it's going to blur it. Let's bring up the RGB intensity to make it more obvious. So I can start to paint a nice gradient on here. The other thing I can do is I'm going to switch color here and set this color to a bright red so that I can start to go back and forth between these. Let's bring down RGB intensity and maybe get a smaller alpha, maybe something like this. So I'm just going to get some base coat. 
a very long time ago. I took a very, very long time ago. Uh, I was taking classes at Noman School of Visual Effects here in Hollywood. I took an awesome texturing poly painting class with Madeline Spencer. And I still use her techniques today because I always thought that they were awesome. And I always think of painting sort of in layers, not necessarily literally 3D layers, which you can do, but but just sort of different passes of different opacity. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the C color here, C key, and that's going to sample this color wherever I'm hovering. But I want to get more of a green. I can sample over that. Again, start to blend. Again, sorry for the sniffing. It's cold season here in Los Angeles. So everybody's got a cold. Another thing you can do when you're poly painting is notice I'm using color spray. Um, and I'm going to set, I've, I've set the scale variation to one and the color variation to zero. And uh, maybe I can change the, uh, the placement. The placement slider right here, that controls how far apart each dot is. If I switch the color here, you see it, uh, right there, I have a fairly wide spread. If I go in here and bring the placement down, it's going to be kind of more narrow, right? And if I bring the placement up, it's going to be more widespread, right? Now, the other thing I could do is notice that we also have this spray stroke type. This does the same kind of thing. The main difference between color spray and, and spray is that color spray uses this color slider to add randomization to the hue. If I bring this up, you're going to see you see how it's randomized in the hue there, which could be nice, but I like to have it maybe not so random. If I switch to spray, that same color slider, instead of randomizing the uh, hue, it randomizes the value. So if I bring this up, it's going to be about the same hue, in that same color red family, reddish orange family, but you can see the value is being randomized. So I might bring this down so there's no longer randomized. So why would I want to do this? What I could do is I could have a different setting for this. Maybe I want to have the placement on this really wide and the placement on the color spray fairly narrow. And that way I could switch between these stroke types while I'm painting. So maybe I want a really wide spread and then maybe I'll switch over to color spray, have a really narrow spread, even though the color is kind of the same. So it's a nice way to kind of create a quick variation. It's one of the many techniques that you can use in ZBrush for uh, for creating variation really quickly just by switching between stroke types. And then I'll smooth this a little bit. Let's bring up some of that green color. I can, do, I can hold the Alt key, of course, and that will switch to the color here. Switch the color variation so I can do more of a, of a gradient into that green. So I'm holding the Alt key. Let's uh, switch color and actually switch color again. C to get this red. I'm going to switch to another alpha. Maybe something a little bit tighter like this one. Bring up the RGB intensity. Hello, Luciana. Nice to, uh, nice to see you. Thanks for joining us today. So now I can get these little speckled dots and blur those a little bit. I'm going to also discuss some other polypane techniques while I'm doing this. Let's get some magenta in here. So I'm going to switch the color and set this to more of a, a deep magenta and bring magenta into the stem here. And let's switch to that spray so it's a little bit tighter. Actually, the color spray. There we go. And you can see that I can blur that. You see how it's creating some nice variation in there. So I probably have more of a magenta here at the bottom. It's kind of like I have in my reference. You can kind of see how it goes red at the tips. The greenish, yellowish green to magenta here at the at the uh, at the stem. And blur this out. Thanks. I'm really glad that you're enjoying it. I love to talk about ZBrush, so I can do it all day long. I can only do an hour today, unfortunately, so this is going to be a short one. But I 
I just want to get some nice color variation on here. And Okay, another poly paint technique is this gradient button right here. So what is this all about? Switch to another alpha here. This gradient means it's going to create a gradient between these two colors as opposed to doing just the foreground color. Because right now it's just doing the main color. And then this secondary color is sort of the backup. So it does a secondary color when I hold the Alt key. And it does the, uh, when I don't hold the Alt key, it does this color, right? So I'm going to undo that and turn on gradient. And now it's going to, you see how it kind of blends on the edges of the alpha? I get that red and the magenta in the middle. So that's another kind of cool thing you can do when you're poly painting. And maybe in this case, what I'll do is I'll add, use this alpha and yeah, let's bring down the RGB intensity so I can get even more of a blend. So all these different techniques for kind of blending colors. So I like to create subtle gradients. And as you can see, as I layer these on here, it'll become more muddy and less distinct with plants. I want to have a nice kind of muddy, muddy subtle transitions here. You can see surprising colors here and there. Excuse me again for the sniffing. I'm sure that's not fun to listen to. <clears throat> okay, let's do, let's switch colors. So I still have the gradient button on. Now it's going to have more magenta at the edges of that alpha. I'm going to turn off gradient so I can just have that straight up red here at the top. Very, very rosy red. And I don't want to lose too much of this, so I can maybe bring in a little bit more of a dusty orange, a little bit more saturation there. You can see I'm going really, really quickly here. You don't have to sit here and be too precious about it. You can just layer on these base coats. So I'm going to create some variation in a moment. I think I might want to do is I'm going to switch to freehand stroke. And I'm going to kind of create, I think, kind of a yellowish greenish edge here just along the edge to kind of accent this. Now, another technique that I can use to, again, a lot of times when I'm working on, if I'm working on my own personal project, I like nothing more than to spend hours and hours and hours over every little detail. But when I'm working on a job for a client, they want to see something quickly. So a lot of the techniques that I'm showing today are all about getting something fast onto your model as quickly as possible so you can show your client as fast as possible and make them happy. Don't do don't get too fast though, because if they think you're you can do everything really fast, and then that's what they're gonna expect. Big part of being a professional is learning how to train your clients. I know that sounds horrible, but it is very easy in this industry to be taken advantage of because we all love what we're doing and we all wanna do a great job and have people like our stuff. And I know I've I've screwed myself plenty of times by getting too eager and just found out at the end of the day that I just spent a whole lot of time and ended up working for essentially minimum wage. So you have to be careful about that kind of stuff when you're freelance. Okay, so let's talk about something else. Let's do a little bit of surface noise. So I'm going to go down here to surface and turn on noise. Let's move this out of the way real quick. And... Play a noise scale. Play this a little bit. Of course, we can also use the noise plug. And I'm going to put with max on noise just a little bit here. Maybe something like, I don't know. It's always fun to see what these things do. 
Yeah, something like that. Something a little speckled. This. I'm going to choose OK. And then I'm going to choose Mask by Noise. So that's going to create a mask based on that noise. I'm going to hide the mask. Well, let's invert the mask first, and then I'm going to hide it. And then let's pick a darker color and start to come in here and paint. So get some nice detail going really quickly. You could also do apply to mesh, but I wanted to just demonstrate the mask technique. I like doing the mask technique because then I can change colors while I'm painting and invert the mask and just play with it. A little bit more freedom there. Also I'm getting more of a variation in intensity as I paint. Excuse me. This is the kind of look, look that I like to get. Get a little bit of lighter yellow in here. Yeah, that kind of thing looks nice. It starts to get with these, if these colors start to blend. I mean, it's very subtle, but you get these really cool kinds of effects that kind of imply kind of a subsurface kind of, kind of effect. It's pretty neat. Okay, so I got a nice base coat going here. I think the last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to clear that mask and I am going to, excuse me, uh, I'm going to switch to this alpha, this tiny, teeny little dot. I'm going to pick a nice, let's pick a nice dark red like this. And I'm going to bring up the RGB intensity, set this back to, let's say, spray. And kind of go over just to get some dots on here a little pigment a little bit of blurring on those dots I'm not going to worry about the streaking so much because I'm going to blur that this just adds another little bit of quick detail into the color The other reason that I'm going really fast over this and not being super uh, precious is that this is kind of be the, the base coat for all my little petals, my flower petals, and I'm going to apply this to all the flower petals and then convert it into poly paint and then paint variation on top of this so that, so that every petal doesn't look exactly the same. This is just kind of a time-saving method, so I don't have to be super precise at the moment. just need to get something nice and organic and and pretty and, and natural looking. Okay, a little bit more of that. And notice I'm kind of varying the amount of blurring that I'm doing so it's not too uniform. good and then I'm going to do one more pass it's super bright red here at the top and a little bit of green here in the middle yellowish green let's get that greener Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, I've been poly painting in ZBrush since long there was before there was substance, and I do love substance, and I love substance, but honestly, I just find the paintbrushes in ZBrush much more intuitive. It might just be because I had to poly paint for many, many years in ZBrush, so I'm just kind of used to it. But I just find the, the brushes, are for me, are faster and more responsive. Um, but that's a personal taste thing. I got nothing, 
no issues with substance. I think it's wonderful. It's a wonderful program. I also like Marmoset too. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll do initial paint job on a model in ZBrush, and that will be like mainly what I would consider my base color, albedo, whatever you want to call it. And I export that, bring it into substance, and then use substance layers to paint on top of that albedo pass. And that's just a personal preference. It's just a way to get things started. Okay, so let's say that's that's good enough for a start here. Well, all right, I'm going to be picky here. I'm going to get darker magenta down here. Oops, switch colors. Switch back to color spray. There we go. Okay, just super fast here. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, now I have about 3 million polygons, so I think that's good enough. I'm going to go down here to UV map and set my resolution to 4K, 4096. And I'm going to do texture map, uh, new from polypaint. So there's my polypaint texture, right? And uh, I'm going to clone this texture. And then I'm going to go back to this guy right here. And I'm going to apply that, whoops, let's get out of here, get out of the way here. I'm going to apply that texture, and there you go. Now that texture is applied to every petal of my model, so I just saved a whole bunch of time there. But, of course, I don't want to have every petal look the same. I want to create some variations, so I need to convert this texture back into polypaint. So before I do that, I want to make sure I have enough polygons. So right now this is 253,000, so I'm going to subdivide once. That's 1 million, 4 million. Let's do one more time. 16 million. I think that should be good enough. Um, and now I'm going to do go into poly paint, uh, poly paint from texture. There we go. Now I have a poly painted model. Save myself a whole lot of time. Didn't have to do each pedal. So let's save this guy. And we'll do this. Uh, save next. Yeah, money shot is a great term. I like using that term. Uh, it's a family show, man. <laughs> um, yeah, but there's nothing to say that you can't use best of both worlds. You could use poly paint in ZBrush and, uh, um, like I said, bring that into substance. And, again, it's a personal personal preference. But, you know, since this is a ZBrush live stream, I want to kind of show off all the things that you can do in ZBrush. That's kind of my main uh, main impetus here okay so I'm going to turn texture off since all of these are different poly groups I'm going to turn my mask by poly group all the way to 100 that way as I'm painting these guys and not spilling over to the next flower and then I'm going to go in here and so where did the term money shot come from I'm just curious because I always hear people using that and I'm not exactly sure what money shot means should we look it up on Wikipedia Probably not. <laughs> um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, whoops, let's switch color here. Text from my mother-in-law. Okay, so let's switch this. Of course, you can control shift click on this to hide everything else. Another good way we can quickly add some variation here. Let's bring everything back and remember our surface noise. The surface noise projected from 3D. And let's get this out of the way.
Uh, let's see. Let's go back into noise block and use Maxon Noise. And let's try something. Nudius. Nudius Maximus. Nautius Maximus. Let's try the uh, plugin scale. Oh, that's kind of cool. Huh? Oh, that's cool. I'm going to choose OK. And let's do uh, Mask by Noise. OK, I'm going to hide the mask. And just again, just do a real quick kind of maybe pick a couple colors here. Bring down my RGB intensity and choose. Uh, oh, desire. Okay, I always thought it was from porn, but maybe I got that wrong. Um, I'm gonna choose fill object. be too much yeah I think I just obliterated all my hard work by doing too much there that's probably good for that and then we can always bring that back again well the other thing we can do is The way that's looking, little tiny dots there are really nice. Still going to take some time to go over each and every pedal. But, save a little bit of time in the initial coloring. You know, if you're trying to get, like, approval really quick from, from an art director or something, just taking advantage of using UVs and ZBrush. Because um, I think sometimes you forget that UVs within ZBrush are actually kind of can be very useful. Lest we forget. Okay. Eventually what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to create um, you know, it's like if I bring this uh, everything back you can see how these are all bunched down here. I'm going to create kind of a cylinder and tuck these into it so that there's a discrete, discrete stem. You can see that we got some nice, nice color on that one. Let's get, uh, let's get some red back in here. Make sure my mask is still applied.
The other thing you can do is you notice that there's no, not much sculpted detail on here at all. So it's looking a little bit flat. And uh, <coughs> that's okay because what I can do eventually, and let me just, well, I'll demonstrate here in a second, is that I use the mask by color to create various different masks and then use that as a way to create, you know, I can use an inflate brush or just overall inflate based on those masks to add detail based on the color, which could be kind of nice because you can dial it in really specifically because I don't want to have my, my final ones, I don't want to have them being, you know, too boring and without, so I want some detail so that it catches the light, and that kind of stuff. But since I want to do this kind of quickly, again, I'm trying to find, show off ways that you can kind of save time by, uh, you know, various different techniques in ZBrush for doing that. Time-saving tips. here of course you could also just use the mask as a way to kind of add a little bit of surface detail or super surface noise I'm a little too heavy on the magenta there so let's bring back some of the green oh yeah that looks good Do this one and then Flowers have a really wonderful way of using complementary colors. Sometimes it's fairly subtle, sometimes not so subtle, but you know, the whole point, what flowers are trying to do is they're trying to attract pollinators. Many flowers, I mean, obviously there are plenty of plants that are wind pollinated, they don't care about bugs. Um, but those that are trying to attract bugs will use whatever technique they can in order to attract them. Color is one of the techniques. UV light, of course, is another one, which I'm not going to do because, well, we can't see in that spectrum. But a lot of flowers will actually have a little splotch of color in the center of it, which is like a target. This is something that honeybees can see and many other insects that can see UV light. If you are curious, of course, about insect vision, well, you'll be happy to know that I have a whole series on Entomology Animated on in uh, insect vision. Uh, so if I go to entomologyanimated.com, I did this whole series, four part series on how insect eyes work, including the when they see, can see UV light and all that kind of stuff. So a little plug there for some of my fun little animations, different types of insect eyes, if you're curious. I should really do, I'm hoping to do one on pheromones and a few others like that. I also have some videos on fire ant venom and how pompadour beetles work, the chemistry behind that. So check those out. And like I mentioned before, I have a whole bunch of videos on YouTube channel, Entomology Animated, including some time-lapse of various different models 
Skip ad, skip ad, skip ad, skip ad, skip ad, skip ad, skip ad. There we go. You know, so if you like watching me model bugs, lots of stuff on YouTube you can check out. Some of them are kind of like this. Some of them are a little bit with narration, a little bit more detail. So check those out. And like I mentioned before, on Udemy, I have several videos available demystifying ZBrush materials, all about Redshift, MatCap, and standard materials, how to make your own materials. ZBrush for jewelry designers is a fundamentals of all of ZBrush with a uh, emphasis on sculpting for 3D printing and jewelry design. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> as I keel over dead. This one is understanding ZBrush geometry, goes over you know, Dynamesh, Nanomesh, Micromesh, Parametric 3D Objects, Subdivision Services, and more. So check those out on Udemy.com if you get a chance. Okay, so I just want to demonstrate really quickly because I don't think I'm going to have time to do every single one of these pedals uh, today. But I do want to point out what I was talking about when I was talking about mask by color. So I'm going to clear the mask that's on here. Let's save this real quick. And I'm going to go down here to masking, the wonderful masking menu. So many different ways to apply masks. And let's do mask by color, by poly paint. So this brings up this little window right here so we can see our model. And uh, I can go in here and drag from this color. Let's say I want to pick that bright red. So it's going to create a mask based on red. And then I can use this tolerance slider to change the tolerance level, All right? That's a nice way to get a nice little splotchy mask there. If I want to just see the mask or the unmasked, and then let's choose maybe like this magenta color and play with the tolerance there. Right. <coughs> so I'll pick this uh, yellowish green. Sorry about all the disgusting noises. Um, let's say one. Let's say point two five. Let's turn this one off. Something like that. And I choose OK. I have this mask here. I'm going to invert the mask. Hide the mask. And then you can go down here. You know, I could use that as a way to apply color. Again, adding some variation. We're going to go down to the deformation palette and let's choose inflate. I'm just going to click on this and then just choose like 0.1. Sometimes it's easier to see what's going on if I, <coughs> excuse me, turn off the poly paint. Set this to white. You can see it's dialing in some of that noise there. So that's a nice way to kind of create some detail based on the poly paint colors, right? And it's another technique you can use in addition to, you know, if I turn on surface noise. And let's edit this. Maybe I'll bring down the scale. And choose OK. I'm going to hide that mask. Whoops, let's do mask by noise. few seconds and hide the mask 
And again, maybe I'll go in here to deformation and do like a negative inflate minus one. There we go, a nice texture on there. And clear the mask. And then, you know, go in here maybe with the, um, one of my favorite brushes. This is one of Sakaki's brushes, SK Cloth. And it's a great one for, you can do this with like Damon Standard. Just want to get, you know, we have some of these ridges that go up and down here. In addition to the dots. Let's see if I can find a better image here. You know, just create some nice folds in here. I'm going to go to smooth, turn on Z add, bring down Z intensity and just kind of blend this together a little bit. Starting to make it look a bit more natural. And sometimes, you know, if I'm doing a lot of poly painting or a lot of sculpting, I'll switch tasks between poly painting and sculpting just to kind of break things up so it doesn't get too monotonous. Also, I can always use the sculpt to create masks for poly paint, and as you can see, I can use poly paint to create masks for sculpting as well. So it kind of goes back and forth that way. Looking kind of nice, maybe a bit too much, but it's okay. In the final render, this is going to be a little bit on the subtle side, so I can always, if it's too much, I can always shift down in subdivision level and smooth this out, you know, because I don't want it to look too wrinkly. That's a good way to kind of knock back some of the detail if I've taken it too far. And then if I go back up again in A little bit more blended together. It's kind of like using a solvent on clay, you know. Another thing that might be nice to do, let's uh, switch back to skin shade here real quick and turn our RGB back on. Save this. And let me do a nice little redshift render just to see how it looks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the texture palette and import 
um, my libraries, textures, HDRI. Let's see if I have some nice. This is a nice sunrise HDR image right here. And then we can go into the light panel and do background. Choose that texture. I'm going to turn on perspective. So turn on perspective. Thank you. So you can kind of see what that looks like. And I'm going to go in here and choose a redshift material. We could try just clay to begin with. Let's see how well that works. Thank you for reminding me. ZBrush. We'll go into render. Turn on Redshift Render. And let's go to our Lights panel. I Usually the light is a bit intense in here, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Redshift Light Properties and just bring down the Intensity Multiplier just a little bit so it's not blown out. Go to the background, bring down the Redshift Exposure just a little bit. And let's do a render just to see, get a, some idea of how it might look. Uh, with actual decent lighting and shading and stuff. Of course, first I renders, it takes a little while to calculate. And then it's going to do, the way I have it set up right now, I'm just using the default settings, so it's going to do kind of like a global illumination pass first and then start to render it in. So it'll look kind of funky at first. Yeah, I mean, the, the material is making it look a little bit plastic because of the specular highlights, but kind of get an idea of what it looks like with the nice shadows. So let's go into the material palette modifiers and let's bring up the uh, reflect roughness a bit more and I'm going to bring down the coat because I think the coat is causing it to look a little plastic. Could also bring up this subsurface scattering amount a little bit. And maybe diffuse roughness a little bit. Bring down the coat weight. Let's try that. So you're getting some kind of idea there. It looks all right so to begin with, just as an initial pass to get some idea of how the colors are going to look. And of course, like I said, we're going to tuck these in here so it doesn't look so goofy with all these things stuck out. Um, what we can do here is we can go down here to the color and maybe just add a little bit of red to the base color. And bring up the use material color. No, that's going to be a zero or one. I'll bring up the coat roughness, roughness a little bit. Bring down the reflect color weight. And it's also nice to play with the SSS mode. There's three modes. So there's zero, one, and two. Different ways to interpret subsurface scattering. So sometimes that can have a huge difference in how the SSS looks. So I'm just kind of throwing numbers out here to see how they look. I also think the lighting might be a little bit too diffuse in here. Eh, that's looking pretty good. Get some of that velvety color in here. Another good way to get kind of a velvety sheen is to well to use the sheen settings. So let me bring up the sheen, sheen weight. And sheen roughness a little bit. Bring up the IOR a little bit. It's just, I mean, I love tweaking shader settings, so I can do this all day long. Oh, yeah, see that sheen is giving it kind of a little bit of a velvety kind of quality. We throw on like some fiber mesh to get some of these um, hairs on here and then maybe work with the contrast a little bit. I'm going to set the base color back to white because I think that's overpowering. And I'm going to bring down the subsurface amount a little bit. I think that's also overpowering. And 
Ooh, I'm bringing up the reflect a little bit. Oh, that's kind of interesting. You can see how the sheen is affecting the petals where I actually did some sculpting on it, bring out some of the details. Another thing that might be good to do is to maybe uh, rotate this a little bit so we get more of a backlighting and let's bring down the gamma a little bit. Uh, some interesting looks there. Not exactly what I want, but it's fun to play with. And definitely getting some backlighting. Let's go in here to the light. Let's turn this off so we're only getting outdoor light. And maybe I'm going to go here the redshift exposure and bring it down just a little bit. I don't know why I started whispering when I bring it down. So you can kind of see how when you render, especially whether you have a lot of subsurface scattering, a lot of that poly paint uh, subtlety is going away. And getting the detail here, but kind of losing that quite a bit. So let's bring down the subsurface scattering a bit. Sometimes it's nice to choose. And, oh, no, I think I'm going to stick with this material because it is a poly paint material. Yeah, that's getting better. That's a little bit better. There we go. Now we can see the color coming through. That's kind of cool. It's a little bit extreme in terms of the shadows, but now we're getting an idea of how those colors blended together, mixing with the light. This right here, this is starting to look a little too stony to me, so I'm not crazy about that. So I'm going to go in as I sculpt and kind of soften that a little bit so it doesn't look like stone. I want it to look more like a plant. Um, again, one of the things I've learned over the years is that hair makes everything look even better. So as I add some fiber mesh on here, it's going to look even more realistic. And that's also true for the insect itself. So I'm going to leave that here for this week because uh, i got to run. And uh, next week I'm going to continue with this and start uh, adding my insect and posing it so that we can kind of see the insect and the flower in uh, together And because I want to make sure that they they look like they belong in the same universe. So that's going to take a little bit of work there. So I uh, hope to see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in this week and, and uh, watching me do a little bit of flower painting. Um, if I do some work on this during the week, I'll create a YouTube video so that you can see what I've done in the interim, uh, j just in case you want to follow along with what I'm doing in the project. So once again, thanks very much for tuning in uh, this week, and uh, I'll see you next time. And I hope you guys all have a good week.